Lord, we just praise you and thank you for your blessings in this day, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you, God, that each one of us has a story to tell about what you've done in our lives. And I thank you for our sister's willingness to, to get up here and share that with us. And we pray, God, that you would be with her in this time and just speak to our hearts, each one of us, as, uh, as she relates what you've done for her. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was going to try to memorize this. And I'm just going to kind of read it. So. <laughs> Y'all have to forgive me. Can I use your phone? You can. Okay. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Dina Stead. Justin and I have been attending church here for about a year and a half, give or take a little. Um, I'd say a good many of you know me because my husband says that I've never met a stranger. So if you don't know me, you probably at least talk to me. I need to start by making sure you all know that I'm by no means a preacher, not a Sunday school teacher, I'm not a public speaker or anything like that, so bear with me. My story, my life story, my testimony, whatever you wish to call it, is not always fun to tell, but like most people, I have a few skeletons in my closet. Uh, some of those I'm not very proud of, however, I need to talk about them in order to to tell you where God has brought me back from. Without the Lord and my salvation, I have no doubt that I would not be standing in this building alive and well. I have no doubt about it. Alive and well. Uh, Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This verse has long been cited in the field of addiction, recovery, and sobriety. In this verse, Paul warned us about being overconfident. Thinking we are stronger than we are actually can cause us to be vulnerable. The real promise of hope in this verse is the fact that God will always provide us with the strength to say no. God's strength is our strength to bear. Corinthians 6.12 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. You may have the lawful right to consume any substance you can imagine, but not all things are going to be helpful or healthy to you. Alcohol and drugs have the ability to dominate you, and turn you into someone you truly are not. Paul seems to preach about moderation here, but the point is that while all things could be legal, not all are beneficial to us. We should not allow ourselves to become a slave to our own personal liberties. That's exactly what happened to me. I became, and I mean quickly became, a slave to opiate pain medication. And not as a child or as a teenager, but at a much later age in life than one would, would think that you would become addicted to pain medication. Actually, after I was already married and I had two small children, my life was a disaster. However, I was, I was what is often referred to as a highly functioning addict. I didn't become homeless. In fact, I lived in a brand new three tri-level house in a nice subdivision. I wasn't penniless or without work. I was actually a small business owner. Uh, I never missed a school party. I attended every PTA meeting. I was a homeroom mom. I was very active in my children's school. I was literally burning the candle at both ends. I was juggling about half a dozen balls in the air and trying to never let them touch the ground. And for a while I did that until I didn't do it anymore. And when they did, and when it, they did actually fall and all the balls went everywhere, it was kind of like a strike at a bowling alley, but not in a good way. When I finally dropped the balls, so to speak, they fell hard and they crumbled into a million pieces. It wasn't pretty and it didn't just affect me. It brought down the whole production. My parents, my husband, who at the time was just my boyfriend, my children, as well as Justin's children, 
It was October 3rd, 2003, when I hit what addicts call my rock bottom and finally decided to do more than just go through the motions of rehab because this wasn't my first rodeo, as they say in Texas. I'd gone to rehab before, just for the wrong reasons. I went for other people, not for myself. Usually I went to either gain forgiveness from somebody or because I was about to be in serious trouble with the law and I figured the only way to get out of it was to go to rehab. But this time was different and it wouldn't be until years later that I would actually figure out what the difference was. It was God, his divine touch. Mostly, though, it was my total surrender to him. The real belief that he would see me through this awful addiction, that I finally realized that I had zero control over drugs. Proverbs 25, 28 says, A man without self-control is like a broken a city broken into and left without walls. I felt like that broken wall of city for a very long time. Even after I got off uh, the drugs, I still felt broken. Uh, until I finally one day decided my life was worth fighting for. I was worth fighting for. There was one verse that I don't remember what, somebody must have said it in rehab or something, but it really gave me strength. And when I would be sitting in rehab class, I would just keep jotting it down, trying to memorize it. And I memorized it then, but I can't remember it now, so I'm going to read it. It was uh, Romans 13, 12, and it said, The night, hold on, Romans 13, 12, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, I don't know exactly what this verse is supposed to mean or how, you interpret it to what you're going through in your life. But this is what it meant to me at that time. The night is far gone. To me, that meant that I, was no, I no longer had to remain afraid and alone in the dark. The day is at hand meant that there was literal light at the end of this long, dark, awful journey. Cast off the works of darkness. This meant for I needed to take action, not just talk the talk anymore, because I was good at that. But I needed to walk the walk, do something different, rebuke the evil and the darkness of the devil and the drugs, and put on the armor of light. That meant prepare to fight for my life. Armor up against the devil himself and against drugs. And I had to not just prepare to fight, to live by fighting the devil, quitting drugs, fighting myself and the cravings that I was having, but even my so-called friends those that I used with, I used drugs with every day. I had to armor up to fight it all. And without finally asking God to stand and fight alongside with me, I wouldn't have a chance of survival at all. And even with God on my side, it was touch and go several times. I stand here today as a living, breathing testimony of what God can do in a person's life if we would only give all of ourselves, not some, but all of it, and turn it over to him, allowing him to work his miracle. It wasn't fast, it wasn't easy, easy, and it sure wasn't pretty at times, but it was possible. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And boy, was that true, and it still is true. The devil just waits patiently for us to become weak and vulnerable so he can devour our lives. I fell, I relapsed several times, but since October 3rd, 2003, I've remained clean. No relapses, no devouring by the devil. My armor is on and the fight is a daily fight. One I can't afford to lose. And with God's help, I am winning the battle. If you or someone you know is fighting this disease and not necessarily winning the battle, or maybe they're, they're winning the battle, but they just need a little reminder that they're not alone, feel free to say something to that person. Or if that person is you, find somebody you can talk to, someone you can trust, someone that will pray with you. Thanks for your time. Continue to keep me in your prayers. We say one day at a time for a reason, because the battle is just that. It's fought daily. We are only promised this moment, so don't get too caught up in tomorrow. Fight hard for today because tomorrow is not a guarantee. Thanks.
Amen. Thank you, sister. Wow. Good job. What a blessing. I told uh, Dan, I was like, okay, she wanted to say that to the small group. I said, okay, you, you, you've done that. We're going to have to graduate you to a bigger group of folks. So, uh, that's a, message. a lot of people need to hear it. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We are talking, and remember the context of this. What is the context of this? Started off sex. That's what started this whole thing off was, uh, and we talked about what biblical sex is, what sex and marriage is, and, and all of those uncomfortable topics that we were talking about. And so, uh, so whenever, whenever Paul introduced this whole deal about sexual relations, he started off with a negative, right? Remember the immoral person in church and all of that, how they dealt with all of that. Well, it's you know Paul does this in his writings. He introduces a topic, he got the problem, and then he starts going into the solution. And so, so he goes from okay, this this uh, sex outside of marriage and all this stuff's bad, and we went over all of that. And so then he's like, well, well, let's talk about what real sex is and what does that look like? Sex within marriage. Well, then he's talking about marriage, so then it's got, well, now we need to talk about marriage. And then, we're talking about marriage, but we got to talk about divorce. So it's, it's, it's just rolling on the whole uh, topic. And last week, we talked about uh, exceptions for God's perfect plan of marriage. And so I want to back up just a little bit and reset the stage. Because here's what we have. In marriage and divorce we have God's perfect plan for marriage and then we have man's imperfect solution for our hard hearts and we looked at one of these passages last week and I want to go back and look at that uh, I don't think I put it on this week's deal it's in Genesis 2 21 if you I'll read it if you don't want to have to turn there so God's perfect plan for marriage we find way back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 2. And, uh, and, and, and it is this, Genesis 2, 21, and the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place, and the rib which God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And we talked about, the, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, you don't really have to have a ceremony to be married. You know, we don't we don't see anywhere in the Bible a ceremony of marriage. Well, that's not true. This is a ceremony right here. We talked about the last thing. What did God do? What does the what does the father do with his daughter? Bring his bride to the yeah. groom. Right? He brings his bride to the groom. Who well they say, who gives this woman to be married? And they say, uh, her mother and I, right? Their father brings to, well, what did God do? He said he brought her to the man. So the first marriage ceremony is officiated by Almighty God. And, and then Adam says, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she should be called woman. And here's the spiritual aspect of, of, and we talked about when we're talking about what is biblical sex. And remember we talked about Satan has made sex into just the physical act. The pleasure of the physical act. That's all there is to sex. That's what the world sees. And that's what, I'm going to tell you, that is what 90% of the church sees. They've been blinded by Satan. They have taken the world's view of sexual relations, and that's what they've incorporated into their, their marriage as believers, and they're completely defeated. Uh, they have problems in the bedroom. They, they, uh, it, it leads to problems in the marriage. It leads to divorce and all these things because they have taken the world's definition of sex, <laughs> which is only about pleasure. And guess what? Pleasure is very important. It's important to God. God made sex a pleasurable act for a reason, but it is a spiritual act. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and, the, and be, join his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And we talked about Paul talking. That's why you do not have sex outside of marriage, because when you come together in the physical act, your spirits come together, and you become one flesh. And the only way there's not damage done is you're married. 
If you're not married, then whenever you're done with the physical act, there is spiritual damage as well. I don't want to reteach all of that, but uh, this is God's perfect plan, and it is one man with one woman forever. That's it. There are no exceptions in God's perfect plan. There is no divorce. There is nothing. It is one man, one woman forever. Well, what we get into is this, that, that this was before the fall, right? This is before Adam and Eve fell into sin. And so once Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered in the world and their hearts became hard. And so, and so what we have here, and this is a pretty interesting thing. I don't know of anything else in Scripture where we see this. So God has this perfect plan, and we talked last week about all of these passages that seem to indicate there's absolutely no exception for divorce, remember? And we talked about a lot of the denominations, Catholics, Amish, Mennonites, and others, that, uh, you know, hardline Pentecostals, that they, they, they look at these passages of Scripture, they go with God's perfect plan, which is, which is good, it's there, and they disregard the exceptions that are there, and they say there is no justification for divorce, ever, never, for any, not even marital infidelity. They say that's it, you can't do it. And so we talked about last week, well, well we looked at the exceptions, the ones that Jesus made. But here, here is an interesting uh, thing that happens. And if you look at your, and we'll go back and grab these questions, but if you look down there, it says, what are the rules for the divorce among believers? And it says, God's perfect law and Moses and Paul's exceptions. So if you go, turn to Mark 10, my internet was all out, so I couldn't print that on there. The Gospel of Mark, Matthew, at the start of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, chapter 10, Mark 10, pretty lengthy passage. I'm going to read it. And we talked a little bit about this last week, but there's a different point I want to make about it. So Mark 10, 1 says this, And then he arose from there and went to the region of Judea by another side of the Jordan. The multitudes gathered to him, and as he was accustomed to do, and he had taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation... God joined them, male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his life, and two become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And so we hear that said at weddings. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, in the how, in, and in his house, the disciples also asked him about the same matter. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife, and commits and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Mm -hmm. He gives no exceptions, right? This we talked about this the other day. This is one of the proof texts that people that say there is absolutely no reason for divorce they'll go to the. This is Jesus' words. You know, a lot of people. And look, my Bible has got red letters where Jesus mm -hmm. talks. Guess what? Mm -hmm. Everything should be read. Mm -hmm. Every word in the Bible should be read because Jesus is the word. It's good to know what he come out of his mouth, but it is no less the word of God than what else is in there. And so you can't just go to the Bible and say, uh, well, it's in red, so we're going to just listen to that and exclude everything else. But here's what Jesus was doing. Jesus is God, okay? And so this is what Jesus is concerned with. God's perfect plan is perfect. And that's what he told them. This is my plan. I am God. You do not get a divorce. But what did he say? Who? What did he say? What did Moses command you? Did you pick that up? He didn't say, what did I command you? What did God command you? 
What did Yahweh command you? He said, what did Moses command you? And he says this, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. So this is one occasion, the only one I know of, you know another one, we'll talk about it, where God allowed a man to make a commandment to govern his people in the Old Testament. This command for divorce, God did not lower himself to give a command against his perfect plan, which is one man, one woman forever. That's God's plan. But God knew men had failed. We we're sinful creatures. We have hard hearts. We couldn't live up to that. And so what did he do? He allowed Moses to give a commandment for a solution to our hard hearts. Yes, ma'am. That goes by the heart. That's right. And so this is an imperfect solution, but it is a legitimate solution that God allowed to be put into his law. And so this is for the Old Testament. We even talked about God divorced Israel, right? We talked about that last week. So, and it says God hates divorce, but God himself got a divorce. He got a divorce from Israel. And guess what? They're going to be reunited. And, uh, and so uh, those are spiritual terms and all of that. So, but here we see this again. And this is the big question when we get through all of this, because I'm going to tell you what most people, most Christian people that are divorced and remarried have botched the deal. They have not followed the biblical guidelines for divorce. They're not to follow the biblical guidelines for remarriage. Most of it is done in sin. Most of it is done as adultery and all of that. And so when we get all through this, the, we're going to answer these big questions. What about, what about me? What about my situation? You know, and there are lots of, what my, my husband or my wife left me. Or I'm the bad guy. I'm the one that committed the adultery and caused them. What about me? And those all are going to be answered. But is but so here we have this. We have uh, Moses in the Old Testament that God allowed to give a command. But look what happens in our chapter of 1 Corinthians 7. He does the same thing for believers in the New Testament that he did for Israel in the Old. First Corinthians 7, 6. What does it say? It says, But I say this as a concession, not a commandment. So again, God... Knowing our hearts are hard, he allowed Moses to make a, a concession to God's uh, perfect plan through a divorce. Here he is giving Paul, and again, I, these are the only two places in Scripture I know where this has occurred. Paul says, this is a concession, not a commandment from the Lord. He's not messing with God's perfect plan right here. Paul is not. This is in place. But he says, for I wish all men were even as I, myself, but each one has his own gift from God in this, the matter of that. Remember, Paul was not married at the time, and he wasn't planning on getting married. He, would, he could control his own body. He, he wasn't burning with passion. And so what he was saying is, hey, look, if you've been divorced, it's better to be like me. Just stay unmarried if you can. But then what's he say? But I say to the unmarried, the unmarried, if you're sitting here and you've been divorced and you're not married or your husband has died or your wife has died, listen to this. Here's, here's Paul's exception that was like Moses' exception to the, God's perfect law. It is good for them if they remain even as I am. What's Paul doing? He's following this right here. He's like, look, I can do it. I have the ability to follow this right here. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So there's the exception. There is, uh, and he says it's a gift. Paul talks about being able to be single without that relationship is a gift from God. Not everybody can do it. 
Jesus even himself said, you know, some are eunuchs and some make themselves eunuchs. That doesn't mean they castrate themselves. It means they say, look, I'm not having sex no more. I'm making myself a eunuch. I'm devoting my life to the Lord. But he says that's a gift. Not everybody can do that. And so, and so that's the exception. Uh, the perfect thing, the perfect plan that God gives for marriage, one man, one woman, and that's it. Uh, but, but he makes an allowance. He allows Paul, just as he let Moses make an allowance in the Old Testament, he allows Paul to make allowance in the New Testament because he knows not everybody can do that. And so can you imagine uh, if, you, if you say, well, I, I am bound by the perfect law of God in marriage, and let's say your spouse leaves or, uh, or, or they die or whatever, and yet you have passion and desire to have a relationship and all those things. God doesn't want you to spend the rest of your life in burning passion because you know what's going to happen? Fornication is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why he makes this allowance. And so uh, we want to we wanna see the difference between what's God. That's why there's some confusion here because God never deviates from his perfect plan for marriage. But uh, but he makes allowance. Yes, ma'am. I want to say something in self-defense of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that the men and the women that live there, they really do give their life to the Lord, just like Paul. Mm -hmm. And it's a choice when they join. Yeah. And and again, but but here would be here would be the uh uh not a rebuttal of that. God knows what's in the heart. So you can say, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be married or I'm not going to do this, but we see what's mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. And we see the hundreds of thousands of child molesters mm -hmm. and who tell know what going on in the background or what's in your heart. And so mm -hmm. there are some that do that, that, that are genuinely, mm -hmm. uh, devoted to the Lord. And there's some that are outwardly looked that way, but inwardly mm -hmm. they're not. And so again, if they have that gift, they can do it. Whether they're a Catholic or a Protestant or whatever, if they don't, it's they're they're gonna they're gonna stumble in one way or the other. So, all right. Hopefully that any questions on that, the difference. Hopefully that clears that up because there are some people that say you can never get divorced, and if they're strictly looking at God's perfect plan for marriage, they would be right. But if they're looking at somebody else and saying. Oh, you got married and uh, you got divorced and remarried. You're living in sin. See, this is what the Amish do. If you're in an, and, and, and Mennonite community too, you'll come join their church and you've been divorced and remarried. You know what they tell you got to do? No, you got to divorce your current wife that you have children with and you've been living with for ten years and go get back with your with your first oh wife and let. God. It's just ridiculous. It's, it, and so, uh, don't let anybody ever tell you that if that's. If that's your situation. All right. We, what do we talk about the rules for divorce in between believers and non-believers? Uh, there were two exceptions. There was uh, sexual immorality. And there was this one. And we expanded on this a little bit. abandonment but but we talked a little bit about that funny word if you look at the second uh, the second uh, question there it says what are some scenarios that could fit the exceptions remember we talked about the word such cases the Greek in this word such if you look at where it's used like 90 times in the New Testament, uh, it, it, it really, it, a way that you can look at that is in, in similar cases. So, so the, 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 remember the, the, the passage was if, you're, if a believer is married to a non-believer and the non-believer leaves, let them leave, you're not bound. So that's clear. That's a clear deal. Mm -hmm. And some would say that's the only other exception besides sexual immorality, uh, uh, you know, an affair or whatever. And, and 
And we talked about this word, porneia, the Greek word, doesn't necessarily mean just having an affair. It, it is any sexual immorality. And so that, that's a little bit broader term than just having, you know, a sexual encounter with somebody outside of marriage. Abandonment, the scenario Paul gives that we read last week says you got a believer and a non-believer, they're married, and the, and the non-believer wants to go, he says, let them go, you're not bound, you can remarry. But here's the thing, in that word, similar cases. So that, that indicates that it's not just that particular scenario where a, a, the non-believer wants to take, physically go, I'm gone, I'm out of here, I'm leaving, I'm leaving you and the kids, I'm, I'm out of here. Abandonment, what could some other things that are similar to that? And we talked about this last week. We talked about abuse. Mm -hmm. We talked about, uh, and that could be physical or emotional. We talked about, uh, you know, Paul commanded us, remember what he said? Wife, your body does not belong to you. It belongs to your husband. And you can't withhold it from him. And, and husband, your body does not belong to you. You can't withhold it from your wife. It belongs to your wife. We talked about how you don't, you don't, you, there are ways that you can be sinning against your spouse and how you handle that situation. But, but, but it says, do not neglect your marital duties to your spouse. That can be abandonment too. You just say, forget it. We're not, we're not having that part of the relationship anymore. <clears throat> or you're abusive. Uh, or, or, or whatever. Um, and so, I, I told y'all last week that you would have to be prayerful about that, and that's going to be abused. I guarantee you people will abuse this teaching because most people that are ready to get divorced, they done made their mind up, and they're just looking for justification. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but you need to know there are reasons why you can get a divorce other than a flat-out marital affair. And, 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 and here's what really backs up this is that next verse down. It says, uh, we are called to peace. Where am I at? Verse 15. If, a believe, if an unbeliever departs, let him depart. Or a brother or sister is not under bondage. In such cases, there's that thing. In similar cases to what I just said, and it talks about your children being clean, and then at the end it says, but God has called us to peace. So if you're in an abusive marriage relationship, you're not living in peace. God's, and, you've, and they have abandoned uh, what marriage is all about. Even if they haven't physically left the home, they have abandoned the marriage. And so, and so that brings us uh, to this thing. So remember, this is about a believer and a non-believer. Matter you together. So, so here's the big question. How does that apply to believers that are married to one another? Because you got a church that's got a divorce rate that's as the same as, as uh, the world. About 50%. It's crazy. And, and I'll just tell you right up, most of those divorces are unbiblical within the church. But there are exceptions. And so right now, people will say that these exceptions, abandonment, abuse, all of those things, they don't apply to believers married to one another. But is that what the Word of God says? So here's a question. So this is the rule, remember, believer married to unbeliever. And here's, here's a question. If you look at chapter, I mean, question five, were there other situations where a believer can be treated as a non-believer? We're going to look at a couple of those right here. I've got them on your paper there, 1 Timothy 5, 8. Listen to this. But if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for those who, of his household, he is denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. That pertains to the marriage situation right there, right? What if the person, the spouse, is just not providing for their own family? And they're just, you know, they're, uh, 
they're going and gambling everything they got at Vegas every weekend or, or drinking it up with, uh, you know, or dope or whatever. It says right here, they're worse than an unbeliever. What about 1 Corinthians 5, 13? But those who are outside God judges, therefore put away the evil person. This is that expel the immoral brother that we talked about from the church. This is a believer. This is a, this is a born again believer in Jesus Christ is having a sexual uh, 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 affair in the church. He's committing adultery, and they say, treat him like an unbeliever. Kick him out of the church. So there are, uh, and there are other cases, I didn't put all in there, where a believer can be treated as a non-believer if they reject what? The law of Christ. If you're going to live like a non-believer, and you're going to reject what God says, then you can be treated as an unbeliever. And so that brings this back into play, uh, these exceptions to marriage, if the one of the spouses is behaving like a non-believer. Any questions about that? Anybody want to push back on that? You feel free to do it. All right. I'll be glad when we get done with this divorce stuff. <laughs> Amen. It's important, though. It's a big deal in the church, and uh, it's where we are as Corinthians, so we're not going to sidestep it. It's tough, though, if you've lived through it. Yeah. Um, so, here's what I mean by most uh, Ameri uh, divorces within the church are unbiblical, because there are steps you need to take. If, uh, if, if you are a believer and you're contemplating divorce, the Word of God gives us steps to take that we need to try to follow. And we see these steps in Matthew 18, 15. And this will apply to a, a marriage gone bad. And so if you're contemplating divorce, obviously, if a person is contemplating divorce, obviously a partner is sinned against the other partner. You, would, or you wouldn't even think about it. And so here's what you do. It says right here, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So in the context of marriage, I'm sure there's been many conversations about whatever issue is going on that is, is leading towards possible separation. If we will not hear it, take with you one or two others by the mouth of two or three witnesses may be established. So if your marriage is in trouble uh, and you can't get things worked out between the two of you, then... You've got to say, look, we need help. We need outside help. We need to get somebody else involved in this process. In this day and time, it's pretty easy because there's Christian marriage counseling. So, so you can you can bring others into the mix. Maybe maybe you have friends, you know, mutual friends that that are, be are believers, and y'all you can go to them and say, hey, look, we're in trouble. We need help. We need prayer. We need counsel. We need advice. If he refuses to hear, hear them, so here's the steps. You got trouble in your marriage, and it's bad. Maybe somebody's been unfaithful or something like that. Uh, you try to work things out among yourselves, and you just you just can't get there. And then you bring in outside help, other believers. Now, not, not do not go to non-believers to help with this thing. Whether it be professional counseling or friends or whatever, still not getting worked out. Still, you've got this sin going on in the marriage. Then you tell it to the church. So let's just let's just give, give take a scenario here. Let's say the husband have had an affair and it's ongoing, and the wife is like, talk to him about it. He won't, he, you know, he 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 won't listen. Uh, she's talked to their friends, and they've talked to him, and he won't listen. Uh, she's asked for marriage counseling. He won't go, uh, and on and on and on. And so then, and he's a believer now, or he claims to be a believer. So she's gone through these steps, refuse, refuse, refuse. Then you go to the elders of the church and say, look, 
a marriage disaster. Me and my children are, are, are going through whatever's going on. Can you help me? And so then church discipline kicks in because the elders of the church are there to protect the flock. And so then the elders would call the man in, in this situation, the man in. And they would talk to him about his, uh, his situation. And, uh, and let's, say, let's say he says, forget you guys. Who are y'all? Stay out of my business. This is my marriage. This is my life. You, do, you, you, you worry about you and I'll worry about me. And what's he say to do? But he refuses to listen to church. Let him be to you like what? A non-believer. Yeah. A heathen, a tax collector, a non-believer. So, so if you've gone through these biblical steps and you've exhausted them, hey, look, it is all about, it, the Bible does not say if your spouse commits adultery, you need to go to divorce. That's not what it says at all. In fact, it says you need to do everything you can to forgive and reconcile. It's, that would be the hardest. And there may be some that have dealt with that, but that would be the hardest to overcome. But God says forgive. And if you can, you need to do it for the best interest of you and your Lord, children, your relationship, whatever. But sometimes it can't be done. Sometimes one spouse just refuses. And so what does it say to do? You treat them like a non-believer. That opens the door back to that imperfect solution that Paul laid out for us. Uh, but most people don't go through those steps, you know. Most people don't even know those steps are in the Bible. No. And, so they, <laughs> and so they end up maybe starting out justifiably. They had a reason to justify to get a divorce, but the way they went about it wasn't wrong or was wrong or whatever. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Even if you went about it the wrong way. Even if, here's the question, what if you're the bad guy? What if you're the guy that had the affair that destroyed your marriage? And now you realize, oh my goodness, what did I do? But your wife is done gone and divorced and remarried. What, do you, what, what are you doing? Are you stuck? Will you stay single the rest of your life? Look, you admit your sin. You confess your sin. You go to your previous spouse or talk to them and say, I sinned against you and I sinned against God. I'm sorry for what I did. I know we're going on with our lives, but I just want you to know that I acknowledge what I did was wrong before you and wrong before God, and I'm going to try to live the rest of my life for the Lord. That's what that's about as far as you go. And then you, you know, uh, whenever you confess your sins, the word of God says God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So if you were the sorry scoundrel that caused the whole deal and wrecked the family out and wrecked your kids out and all of those things, there is hope and forgiveness for you. And God can take you where you are and he can use you to uh, go on and with your new family. And so there isn't any scenario where it's hopeless for you. Now, I would say this. God, uh, and we're going to talk about single. We probably don't have time today. But we're going to, the next topic before we wrap all of this up is singleness. And the benefits and the values of singleness and, and all of those things. You go back to God's perfect plan. If you have the gift of singleness, if you have the gift, the ability to live your life, just you and the Lord. Do it. It's the best option. It is, hey, it is the least problems you're going to have. Because what, what does Paul say there? He says, uh, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Strive to be like him. Uh, where are we at anyway? What was it on the end of 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 the
And we're going to come back and read this in a minute again, but it's a point I want to make. It's in verse 28, 728. He goes through all these scenarios, and just like what I talked about, but he says, but even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, you have not sinned. But here's the thing. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, and I want to spare you that. If you have ever been divorced and remarried, then you're going to have trouble. you got all the emotional baggage that you carry from your previous marriage, and, and especially if you got kids. If you got your kids, my kids, our kids, that, that is trouble. It, 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 but, but it's not a sin if you do. And so Paul, what he's saying is, hey, stay single if you can. I want to I save you all the trouble of trying to make a second marriage work because it's hard. But if you can't, you haven't sinned. And so, anyway. Uh, and it's not a sin. Though. Yeah, not a sin. Not a sin. All right. I don't know how clear I was with all that. Yeah. And hopefully it made mm -hmm. some level of sense. All right, let's get on now. And, uh, and, and we're going to read. Somebody read. We're going to start at 17. Uh, somebody read 17 through 24. All right, I got it. <laughs> but as God distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. That's a rhetorical argument because I don't think you can undo that. Uh, was anyone called while uh, uh, when circumcision is nothing? Was anyone, hang on, back up. Was anyone called while uncircumcised, let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Again, he's saying, look, are you a Jew? Don't not become, unbecome a Jew. Keep on doing what you do as long as you understand where your salvation comes from. If you're not a Jew, don't become a Jew. We talked about this here a few weeks ago, Hebrew Roots going on in the church. We've got all these people that are trying to go back under the law of Moses. Meeting on Saturday, keeping kosher, don't eat pork. It's huge. You're gonna, if you haven't heard of it, if you're on the internet, you will. As sooner or later. It's big in the church. He's saying, don't do that. If you're not Jewish, do not do that. You stay in whatever position you were in when you were called, unless God moves you out. Were you a, were you a slave? Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. Now, that's pretty tough, right? Mm -hmm. So so here we got a slave that, that, that finds Jesus. They're born again. And what God say? Hey, don't worry about it. You just keep on being a slave, but if God makes the circumstances allow where you can be free, praise the Lord, use it. Use it. That's God moving your circumstance. Mm -hmm. For he who was called... Uh, in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he was called while free is, a, is Christ's slave. But you were brought at a price. Don't become slaves of men. Now, you know, back in that day and time, if you got in a bind financially uh, and you couldn't provide for your family, you could sell yourself as an indentured servant to somebody. You became there. And this is, y'all, you need to understand, slave in the Bible is not slave in this country 150 years ago. Completely different deal. In the Bible, we're talking most of the time about voluntary people voluntarily putting themselves under a master so that they could provide for their family. And it was usually a contract. In fact, in the, under the Jewish law, you had to let them people go after seven after years. Right, amen. And so it wasn't, it wasn't, you weren't property in that, in that, uh, but anyway, he was saying, look, it don't really apply to us today, but it says, uh, uh, don't make a slave of me. Here's a parallel, and we could go a teaching on this. I'm not going to. You could apply this to debt. <laughs> well, it's Anybody true. got a credit card yeah. that you can't, you make a minimum payment on? You know what? Guess what? The Word of God says you're enslaved yes. to the one who loaned you the money. Ooh, so there is an application or whatever, but we're not going to get off on that tangent right now. Uh, 
brethren, let each one remain uh, in what state God has called him. And so, you know, what he's doing is he's talking to people that they get saved and just don't worry about it. What you need to worry about when you become saved is growing in the Lord. And you know what? God, let God move you where you, he wants you to go. Don't try to force yourself in one direction or another. God will take care of it. You just grow in the Lord. Now we're going to get back to marriage again. Hey, we've got half a chapter left, and we'll be off all of this, okay? <laughs> um, we got to have some context here. So uh, if somebody wants to read verses 25 through 27, somebody got that? Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord is in, mercy, in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is a good that this is good because of the present distress. That it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. All right. That freaks out a lot of people, singles today. This passage of scripture. You know why it freaks them out? Because they don't, they take it out of context. Okay? They don't understand the context of what Paul is saying. Here's the key to what he's just saying. It says, before he says it's good not to marry, before he says if you don't have a wife, don't get one. If you if you have a wife, don't try to get whatever all that was. What did he say? He he put it in context because of the present distress. So what was going on? Does anybody know what was going on in uh, in in Corinth whenever Paul was writing this letter? It was bad. <laughs> His son had a father's wife or something. <coughs> Who's our speller? Persecution? That's probably That's, not that there. Right. I have to think about that one. So here's what you got going on in Corinth whenever Paul's writing this letter. First of all, they're in the middle of a famine. There's no food. People are starving to death. Christians are being persecuted. So let's just think about this for a minute. If you're absolutely starving to death, you, you, you can't find food. And we don't know what that's like in this country. We've never been in a family. And people are trying to kill you because you're a believer. Is that a good time to get married? <laughs> Is there going to be time to have a, a pleasure with your new spouse and have children and all of that? Not probably a very good time to be thinking about or in the middle of a war zone. You know, I don't know if y'all watched back here when ISIS was overrun in Syria and they were chopping off everybody's heads and kill. Probably not a good time to get married. They would target weddings and they would blow them weddings up and all of that. And so there's context there. He says because of the present distress. So you can't just automatically say, okay, Paul's saying, you know, to all the single people out there, Hey, if you're not married, don't, don't get married. Uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, after he says all that, don't seek a wife. And here he goes. He puts the qualifier. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. So he goes through all this thing. Don't seek a wife. Don't do this. Don't do that. And then he says, but you know what? If you do, you have sinned. He says, I, he says and if the virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, I will... Uh, I will such will save trouble in the flesh. We talked about this in, in context of remarrying somebody that's already been married. There's trouble in the flesh there. I'm going to tell you what. If you're going to get married in the middle of a famine, and you're going to get married in the middle of persecution, or you're going to get married in the middle of a war, you're going to have trouble. It's going to be hard. Very, very difficult. And Paul's just saying, hey, I want to spare you that. I want to spare you that. So that doesn't apply in every situation from all of these 2,000 years from the time he wrote. It could. It could right here. We could get in the famine right here. And, mm -hmm. and, our, and our government could implode. And we could, we could be in total chaos, economic collapse, the whole nine yards. It can and it will happen someday. And if that's the case, then you know what? This would probably apply. 
Yes, ma'am. My parents did that. In in distress. You know, in the famine, oh. they got married. <clears throat> in the thirties, it was like that, mm -hmm. and we were headed for war. Yeah, absolutely. But and, and even even in that. Even in that, Paul says, you had to sin. They didn't sin, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they made it go, you know, and they made it work, and they had probably had a lot of trouble doing it. But so uh, those are not commands. There's not commanding people not to get married. In fact, we're commanded to be fruitful and multiply, right? That's all the way back in Genesis. Mar the Word of God says if you find a wife, you found a good thing. And so marriage is God's plan. It's his perfect plan. Mm -hmm. that, is the, that is what he wants for us. But some people, he gives a gift, and they don't have to get married. And, 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 uh, and so God we, took you know, care of them. Right, he did. He took those needs away from them where they weren't, weren't burning them. All right, uh, we talked about how could think of those situations be difficult. Take uh, your time. Do what? Take your time. We talked about it's not, and why it's not sin. It's not sin because God made us that way. And uh, all right, it's ten thirty. We're gonna cut it off right there. We will spend a, just a short segment of time at the beginning of next week talking about singleness uh, and the benefits of that. The last few verses of that chapter, and uh, and then we will be moving on to uh, other topics other than marriage. Any questions on any of that? I know it's been a difficult deal. It doesn't relate to everybody, but uh, if you if you've dealt with divorce, you're dealing with divorce or whatever. Hopefully, you know you've got some guidelines you can go by, and if you've got some hope, and if you've been through in the past and you didn't do things quite like they should have been done, there's it's not the end of the world. God's got a plan for you. Yep. I just want to say that after my husband got saved which was 21 years later, we had a wonderful marriage. Mm -hmm. And we uh, he lived to be 74 and died with cancer, lung cancer. But we had a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what a blessing. What a blessing yeah. God blessed you with that. Amen. All right, let's go, Lord, for prayer. Lord, we just come to you now. We, we're so thankful for your perfect plan. And Lord, help us. Uh, help that be our goal, Lord God, that we would just follow that perfect plan. But God, we also thank you for your mercy. Even though you yourself are not going to give up on your perfect plan, we thank you, God, that you allowed these men to make exceptions because our hearts are hard. And Lord, we are sinful creatures. And we do have difficulty uh, controlling ourselves and God, we thank you. In your, your, it's your mercy and your love for us that you allow these things to happen. Not that we would take advantage of it. Not that we would abuse it. And Lord, I pray right now a special blessing on any of these that are in this room or are watching on the internet, Lord God, later on. If they have dealt with this or are dealing with this, that you would bring them peace for whatever may have happened in the past. You would give them wisdom for whatever they need to do now and in the future. And God, that you would just provide for them the path to stay uh, on your path. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.